but I think fat is the future. Um, you know, fat is the largest source of adult stem cells in the body and it's the lowest hanging fruit. So while a lot of investment in the regenerative medicine space are in therapeutics and orphan um, disease, uh, those pathways uh, and therapeutics are extremely expensive. And we feel that we can democratize regenerative medicine with fat with say a $400 consumable, which will allow for the deployment of regenerative, regenerative medicine therapeutics all over the world, even in under-resourced environments. Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Grant Stevens, and I'm here in beautiful Manhattan Beach in the studios of Technology of Beauty. If you like the Technology of Beauty, you're going to love the Aesthetic Innovation Summit, or AIS. This May 2024, the day before the Aesthetic Society meeting, we're hosting the fifth annual Aesthetic Innovation Summit. It doesn't matter if you're in industry or finance or clinician, you will love the Aesthetic Innovation Summit. We are going to highlight a number of different new products. We're going to have the ever-popular Shark Tank. We're going to talk about beauty below the belt, emerging technologies, and all sorts of fun topics. So if you want to register, go to attendais.com. That's attendais.com and register for the meeting. Welcome back to the Technology of Beauty, where I have the opportunity to interview the movers and the shakers of the beauty business. And today is no exception. Today we have uh, Dr. Derek Banyard, who's come up to uh, be with us, but he's the founder and CEO of a wonderful company we're gonna hear about today. Thank you, Derek. Thank you for having me. Oh, it was my pleasure, it's great. Um, let's get to know you first. Where'd you grow up? Sure. Uh, so. I come from Virginia Beach, Virginia. Okay. Uh, that's Beautiful where area. I, um, you know, spent most of my young days and attended the University of Virginia for college. Okay. And then where'd you go to med school? So I went to Meharry Medical College. Sure. Which is a historically black medical school in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh huh. And uh, then you did, did you do general surgery or combined? Or? So I had a pretty winding road and winding path. So after medical school, I did a research fellowship at the University of Maryland, primarily in uh, tumor immunology okay. uh, and cell biology. That was right after med school? Correct. Okay. And after that research fellowship of a few years, I ended up doing a general surgery year in West Virginia at uh, uh, Charleston uh, Medical Center in, affiliated with West Virginia University. Okay. After that, uh, I came to California um, via uh, another general surgery year at Loma Linda University. Okay. Uh, Boy, you've been moving around. <laughs> yeah. Um, you so know, that was like an R2 year for general was, surgery? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, I and mean, a couple other things that I didn't mention, but while I was in medical school, I did an MBA at Vanderbilt. Okay. <laughs> Um, and so back to Loma Linda, I spent a year of general surgery there uh -huh. where I decided I really wanted to pursue plastic surgery. Um, wasn't quite competitive enough to get into plastic surgery at that time. So I looked for research opportunities uh -huh. and landed at UC Irvine uh, in the Center for Tissue Engineering. With Alan Widrow. With Alan Widrow and, and Greg Evans. Yeah. Okay, so you went from Loma Linda to UC Irvine. Mm -hmm. And how long were you in that lab? So... I think I was in that lab for about five years. I was only planning to be there for two or three, uh -huh. but I ended up getting a grant from the Plastic Surgery Foundation uh, and my research was really taking off. So I just continued to pursue it. And so before I completed that research fellowship, I got a master's in biomedical and translational sciences from UC Irvine School of Medicine. Okay. Uh, and actually my thesis for that degree was uh, related to um, essentially, I did a very critical analysis and developed a research plan uh, around the idea of attractiveness. And so uh, my thesis uh, looked at the ethnicity-specific cues that define beauty. Interesting. Using AI? Well, to be honest, the thesis likely serves as a great foundation for an AI project. I just never got a chance to pursue it. Okay. But I wouldn't be surprised if some AI companies spring up and uh, they're using some of the principles that I outlined in my thesis. And if so, uh, I want those royalties. Yeah. 
I'd like to l read that thesis. I'm curious now. But okay, so you're there. So you do an R1 year of general surgery, an R2 year of general surgery. Then you're at UCI working with Dr. Widrow, and you are, you spend five years there. Correct. Uh, and then out of that, did you spin this new company, or when did the new company come into this? Well, interestingly, I, I started a company while I was in the research lab, and then I matched into plastic surgery at UC Irvine. Okay. And so, you know, I was helping kind of run this company on the side while I was a busy plastic surgery resident, uh, and things were going okay, but not quite as I envisioned. Uh, the CEO of that company was taking the company in a direction that I disagreed with, and things kind of coalesce in 20. Uh, pandemic, very contentious time in the country, high stress uh -huh. uh, for me particularly. My wife is a physician. We had two small kids at the time, six months and two years. And I saw the perfect opportunity to pivot from the first company into my new company um, and kind of chart a different path. Did you complete uh, a year of plastics then? I completed two years. Two years. Yeah. So, so I've done like four uh, an years R3 total. and an R4 year? Yeah. Uh, well, actually, so when I did, I, I matched into integrated plastic surgery. Okay. So I actually had to start over. So um, I've done an R1 and R2 of general surgery and R1 and R2 of plastic surgery. Okay. Yeah, but integrated. Yeah. And is it integrated five year? Correct. Or six? Five. Okay. And then you spun off. And then right? I spun off. Okay. So um, on your way to being a plastic surgeon, you got off, pivoted, the favorite word of COVID, and then started this new company. What's the name of your new company? So it's Sayenza Biosciences. Sayenza? Sayenza. Sayenza. Mm -hmm. Okay. How do you spell that? S-A-Y-E-N-Z-A. And what's the derivation of that word? So we had another word for the company, but my trademark attorney thought it was going to be too much of an issue moving forward. And so we had to figure out a name. And as most entrepreneurs learn very early on, it's best to create words than to take words because <laughs> uh, there's often some kind, of, some kind of conflict. And so one of my co-founders is South African. And so I looked to the dialects, many dialects that are spoken in South Africa, uh -huh. and we derived the name from two words, Seanzi, which means science, and Inza, which means to build. Interesting. That's great. And uh, when did you form the company? So we formed in November of 20. Okay. So we're about right three years into it. Yeah. Three years. We're coming up on three years, aren't we? Yeah. Okay. Tell us about the company. So we are developing a medical device platform that processes liposuction fat, which is the largest source of stem cells for limitless regenerative medicine and aesthetic applications. Okay. And is it a mechanical device? Is, tell us a little bit more about it. Correct. So. It's a mechanical fat processing device that was originally inspired by the nano fat processing technique that was originally described by doctors Tenard and Verpal in Belgium. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can think about it like a printer cartridge where the printer is a reusable platform and the cartridge is a single patient uh, processing um, disposable um, that mechanically cleans fat for fat grafting in a matter of minutes, but also further downstream processes fat for nano fat type applications. Can it be used for large fat transfers also? 100%. So the platform is designed to process and clean up to a liter of a fat at a time and Whoa. does so in a matter of minutes through dynamic uh, processing algorithms and technology that we are filing IP on. It's also equipped with a um, power-assisted fat reinjector. So many plastic surgeons I've talked to, they'll take their Klein pump, which they use for the infiltration of tumescent solution, and reverse it for the introduction of fat for large volume transfers, mm -hmm. which is very inelegant. Often leads to a mess if uh, the cannula disconnects from the tubing, uh, and is a lot of just workflow disruption. And so not only will our platform, receive the fat, clean it for large volume transfer, process a nano fat type product, but it'll also assist with the delivery of the fat as well. So does the physician purchase the unit that is reusable and then purchase consumables for each patient? How's that? 
Correct. And, and is this like floor model? Is it a table model? Is yeah, it so, big? Is it small? Yeah, so, Give me a feel for it. Yeah, our, our first uh, generation platform is a floor standing unit. Okay. And this one's going to come with all the bells and whistles. Um, not all surgeons need the ability for large volume transfer, but the first one's going to be designed for those individuals. Okay. Uh, and so, yeah, the surgeon would purchase a consumable per patient. Okay. Um, and is this commercially available now? Not yet. Uh, we are, um, so we've raised a, raised a pre-seed round to begin the development of our platform. Uh, so we finished the first engineering phase. Um, we already have a, a working benchtop prototype, but we completed the first phase of engineering for our minimal viable product, our MVP. And so we're currently raising money a seed round so that we can build the product, get it through FDA, and begin those initial commercial sales, which we anticipate will be Q1 of 25. So um, so during 24, you're going to get it approved by the FDA? That's the plan? That's the plan. Okay. Excellent. And then how do you plan on distributing it? So that's a discussion we are having. It's ongoing. Uh, we are talking to at least one national distributor um, in the medical device PRP orthopedic space. We are also open to forming our own sales team and going at it, uh, starting regionally in California and then moving um, nationally into cities, major metropolitan areas where there's high demand and, and high volume. And you said you've raised 2.5 million already on not, the seed round? Not 2.5 million. So we raised our pre-seed round, which was um, about 350K. Uh -huh. uh, prior to that, we were bootstrapped and funded via grants. I mentioned the Plastic Surgery Foundation grant we received. My co-founder received a grant from the NIH. Uh, we've won several pitch competitions as well. We're currently raising a seed round, and uh, based on market conditions, we've decided that 3.5 3 is the number that we need. Okay. And how's that going for you? It's going well. You know, we're primarily raising from individual angels at this point, um, but we were also in talks with a couple different VCs. And so we're just looking for the right fit. Um, we certainly think we can get a significant portion of the way there from individual angels, but it'll probably take a couple VCs to close it out. And what's your uh, post-money valuation after the 3.5? So we aren't putting a valuation on our company yet because we think that the potential is pretty tremendous. So we are raising on a safe note, okay. which is a simple agreement for future equity. Uh, there's no discount, but it's a $15 million cap. Okay. So most of those safe notes I've looked at have a discount. What's the think thinking behind not discounting the safe note? Well, you know, that's a, a, a good question. I, I probably wrestled with it a lot when I figured out the terms several months ago. Um, I think that a cap is pretty concrete and it's easy for individuals to understand because at the time of conversion of a, of a discount, um, the math can get a little bit more wonky. And I think that for in angels, now, you know, we're dealing with a lot of my investors are physicians because that's a lot, of, a lot of my network, but it's much easier for them to understand a valuation cap than a discount. Okay. And, and you can make the That's math fair. we can make the math work out so that the end result is similar. Yep. But it's just from a conceptual standpoint a, a, a cap is, is much easier for most people to understand. I follow that. I uh, and I would agree with you. Um, what's the minimum investment? So the minimum investment is 25,000. Okay. And if someone wants to get a hold of you because they're interested in your technology, can they reach out to you? Are you on Insta? Absolutely. I'm on all social media except for TikTok. So Instagram um, through our website, LinkedIn, et cetera. And is your uh, home office your garage? <laughs> it, it was, um, but we are incubated at uh, Beal Applied Innovation, which is part of UC Irvine. They have an incubator. Okay. We have a lab fabric fabrication space there as well as office space. Um, and so that, that address is on our business website, sansa.com. What's your relationship with UCI at this point? Well, I guess at this point I'm just a startup founder and alumni uh, who's affiliated through their incubator. Um, previously, I was a resident. Yep. I was a student, um, a postdoc. But at this point, I'm just uh, an alumni who is uh, licensing intellectual property owned by the university. So they're, the university is a partner with you on this? Correct. Okay. So even though me and my team 
uh, including my two professor uh, co-founders, invented the intellectual property because it was invented on university property. That's just the rules of the UC system. They own the property, and then we get the rights to license it back. Right. <clears throat> what about people who uh, want to inject small amounts of fat, say facial fat, as opposed to, say, large amounts, say buttocks? Right. Is it the same technology? Is it the same unit? Well, it depends. Well, so good question, and it's a layered question. It depends on the use case. So I was just at the IFATS conference in D.C. Uh-huh. Uh, speaking, you know, with some of the, the thought leaders in the space. And, you know, there's now established uh, parameters of fat. So we have macro fat, which is your typical liposuction fat, which mm-hmm. is typically greater than 2.4 millimeters. You've got your milli fat which is typically anywhere between 2.4 and 1.2 mil- millimeters. Okay. And then you have nano fat, which is typically refined down to anywhere between 600 and 400 microns. The use case of each of those fats is different. Based on my experience, a number of the individuals who are injecting small volumes in the face are using milli fat because they think it has a better take. Some are combining milli fat with nano fat to even improve the take. And then you have individuals injecting nanofat and using it with microneedling type vampire type techniques for skin rejuvenation or they're interjecting they're injecting it intradermal so there's just many different uses of fat right our platform will address all of those uses it will the same the same unit yeah will adjust for all of them correct Uh, are they different consumables then so that's that's our plan is to have different consumables for different applications and you know we'll have our our hero consumable which can do most of those applications and they will actually uh, segregate the fat graphs into the different diameters you've just described for us correct and is that automatic or automated process? Is it a mechanical? Is it energy driven? How does this yes. work? So it's fully automated and it's pump based. So we our platform contains peristaltic pumps, uh, and the chips have all the intellectual property. It's essentially the same concept as like a lab on a chip. Uh, and so um, my co-founder is primarily responsible for the fluidic concepts that drive the tissue disruption or the sizing, if you will. Uh, And so if you think about like a lab on a chip, essentially fluidics uh, or microfluidics is the idea of using dynamic forces. And in our case, it's shear force to disrupt the tissue. And so the first, well, the first device that the fat goes through is our preparation device, which just cleans the fat. Downstream, it goes through an emulsification micronization device, which really helps to disrupt the tissue, break down a lot of the extracellular matrix, uh, and resize the tissue. And then it goes through a filtration device. Um, And the beauty of the technology is that we can adjust filtration size, adjust processing parameters, but everything is fully automated and fully mechanical. Therefore, it's reproducible, which is unlike anything on the market. So given that there's a lot of shear forces and mechanical, if you will, trauma uh, to the adipocytes, have you been able to establish what your percent take is and the survivability of the adipocytes that have been, if you will, traumatized in this various, right. in this method? So that's a great question. Um, for the sake of fat grafting, we want to preserve adipocytes, right? Yes. And there's been plenty of research that demonstrates that less is more. Um, most people are not using the Coleman spin technique anymore just because it's time consuming and you know loading into syringes and whatnot but there's ample data that shows that um, gravity separation decantation telpha um, absorption of the oil etc to minimally traumatize the fat will result in great take that's what our preparation device is designed to do is just minimal processing to separate the tumescent solution and get purified fat Downstream is the mechanical processing, which results in the disruption of the adipocytes, which is what we want. Nanofat is essentially a mechanical um, means to micronize fat, which happens to be the largest source of stem cells. Mm -hmm. Adipocytes have very little to do with that regenerative capacity. And so one of our early, early studies was to essentially deconstruct or reverse engineer the nanofat process where we discovered it's called nanofat, but there's not a lot of fat in there. It's actually more stem cells, extracellular matrix, and other components. Mm-hmm. And so our goal uh, with the mechanical, excuse me, the emulsification micronization device 
is to recapitulate nanofat processing to really release um, or to right size those regenerative comp components, which include the extracellular matrix uh, and the stem cells that are inherent. So I follow that entirely on the nanofat end of it, <clears throat> but on the larger, the larger component, you, you gave us three different size graphs, if you will. Mm -hmm. On the larger one, I, I would imagine, please correct me if I'm wrong, that those were before larger fat um, grafting, such as buttocks and so forth. Correct. Now there, you, you do want the adipocyte to survive, correct? Correct, 100%. And so, yeah, our preparation device is designed to minimally traumatize the fat and to clean away the tumescent solution, et cetera. Now, um, you know, we have a lot of in vitro data. Uh, we've, you know, we always look at our fat in terms of cell viability and cell number. And um, compared to nanofat processing on the, you know, on that nanofat side, uh, we see comparable, if not improved, uh, uh, retention uh, or recovery of cells and viability above 90%. Uh, in terms of macro fat, the assays are imperfect, and we're still kind of working through those assays uh, to have good comparisons. So, for instance, I was at IFATS, and there was a presentation on one of the competitors in the space, and the assays they use for just fat quality are just imperfect. Um, we're currently setting up some animal studies to test the retention of the fat that comes from our device, and we're going to compare it to, say, you know, just a standard macro fat, if you will, as well as some of the competitors. Um, but there's a very important concept that was first introduced by Yoshimura uh, from Japan several years ago called cell-assisted lipotransfer. And the idea is one takes purified fat in one hand mm -hmm. and isolated stem cells in the other hand and combines them. We know that when you inject fat for fat grafting purposes, we don't know how much it's going to take and how much it's going to resorb. It can be anywhere from 20 to 80 percent. Right. When Yoshimura combined stem cells with fat and injected it, take approached 80 percent every time. And so we are designing our system to recapitulate that process by combining the the prepared fat that comes out of our device with the NESVF, which is what we're calling it, non-enzymatic stromovascular fraction, to create a analog to cell-assisted lipotransfer. So and then when you're mixing it, you're basically mixing it with the nanograft, right? Or the nano uh, adipocyte? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, the NESVF, if you will. Interesting. Are you adding anything else? Either we're chemical not, or, or we're not, we're pharmacologic. Not, we're not planning to, uh -huh. uh, but in our reinjection canisters, we want to give the surgeon the ability to add something back if they want to. But you know, that's not that's going to be off label from our standpoint. Okay, fair enough. And where's the price point? So we plan to sell the platform for plastic surgeons for about fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and the consumable we're targeting anywhere from four hundred to six hundred dollars, depending on the capabilities they want. Okay. Interesting. And what's your exit strategy? Well, um, you know, there's a lot of activity in the aesthetic space, as you know. Um, we really see the value in exclusive channel collaborations. There are a lot of applications of the NESVF or the NanoFat product in the setting of, say, orthopedics. That's where but I was going to go with this. Wound healing, um, aesthetics, and so. You know, a striker, if they were to acquire us, they would probably love it for orthopedic indi indication, but would bury it for those other indications. And so we really see a value in exclusive channel collaborations where, say, you know, a striker or whomever might get it for orthopedic indications, whereas an allergen might get it for aesthetic indications, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the fact that uh, one company has already established CPT codes for the reimbursement for the treatment of joints uh, indicates that this is a trend that is moving towards a nice reimbursement strategy. And we would love to white label our platform to companies and sell them uh, the consumable. And uh, then we're approaching unicorn status. <clears throat> How far along are you in the development with orthopedic surgeons vis-a-vis? -vis? Do you have them on your board or your advisory board? Where does ortho figure into this? You're a plastic surgeon by training. Uh, are you working with any orthos? Yeah, so right now we have a clinical advisory board. It's two plastic surgeons, doctors Verpal and Tenard, mm -hmm. and then one orthopedic surgeon. Um, his name is Ethan Kellum. 
So he is an uh, he does ninety five percent orthobiologics, meaning he's primarily just injecting joints. Um, he is a former team doctor for the Boston Celtics and current uh, team doctor for uh, USA Basketball as well as the Tennessee Titans. Interesting. And where's he out of? He's in Nashville. Okay. Well, it's all very exciting. Where uh, where's the future? Where if you have a uh, crystal ball, what do you see in the future? I mean, obviously you need to get approved and then commercialize in 2025. So I guess that's the future. But what else? What would you see bolting onto this, or how might you adjust this going moving forward? Well, I mean, I, obviously I'm biased, but I think fat is the future. Um, you know, fat is the largest source of adult stem cells in the body, and it's the lowest hanging fruit. So while a lot of investment in the regenerative medicine space are in therapeutics and orphan um, disease, uh, those pathways uh, and therapeutics are extremely expensive. And we feel that we can democratize regenerative medicine with fat with, say, a $400 consumable, which will allow for the deployment of regenerative, regenerative medicine therapeutics all over the world, even in under-resourced environments. Um, there's a study that uh, was performed uh, in Nicaragua where day laborers with severe lower limb ischemia and type 2 diabetes who were amputation candidates received an injection of fat stem cells, a single injection, and then just did wet-to-dry dressing changes. And 75% of those wounds completely healed in six months and something like 93% were at least 75% healed by that by that six-month period. Did they inject it into the wound or into the they injected area it around the wound? The or? wound bed and near the pedal arteries, around the pedal arteries. That's amazing. So tell us what orphans mean. <laughs> so these are just those super rare diseases that um, don't have a huge incidence in the population or prevalence in the population, shall mm -hmm. I say, um, but are severely debilitating diseases. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, um, some of the muscular dystrophies or um, there's like diseases you've never heard of, but you've seen something on television. You're like, oh, my God, what is impacting that person? I don't know. But, you know, it's, it's something that a lot of research money isn't necessarily thrown at because the prevalence is so low, but it still has a significant need. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Any comments about exosomes? Uh, the million dollar question. Um, <laughs> it's It's been a topic that has been discussed at every meeting I've been at, because uh, I do attend a lot, I present a lot of, uh, of the fat stem cell meetings. I think that exosomes are going to be the future, but I think we're still in the wild west. I think it's important, and I, I think it, I think that everyone should be wary of claims surrounding exosomes. Not all companies, and frankly, few companies actually characterize what's in the exosomes that they're promoting and the indications they're promoting them for. So I think that it's important to understand that they will be the wave of the future, but I think we're still many moons away, just like the... Um, Bitcoin and um, uh, uh, NFTs uh, were a craze. Mm -hmm. I think they are going to have significant impact on society, but um, right now I think it's more of a fad than proven science. Okay. Well, it certainly is the buzz term, right? Everyone's talking about exosomes. <laughs> well, well, and one thing I would add is a trend <clears throat> that is certainly dear to us as a company and a trend that we're seeing at fat stem cell meetings is it's not just about the stem cells. It's about the other components in the niche in which the stem cells live. Mm -hmm. And so the mechanical disruption is releasing proteins, actually matrix, all kinds of stuff, proteins within cells. And some of those proteins might be packaged, say, in the form of extracellular vesicles or exosomes. Um, but we do think that those components that are in the niche or released by mechanical disruption of the niche are all part of this regenerative process. And you have processes like autophagy or autophagy where the cells are essentially intaking those components to activate genes and regenerative capacity. Mm -hmm. Well, it's very exciting, isn't it? I think so. <laughs> well, I wanna thank you for coming up here and uh, uh, spending the time with us here on the show today and giving us a little insight into your company 
and uh, I wish you the very best. I appreciate it. And uh, it's going to be a busy year for you. Uh, hopefully you'll get FDA approved and then commercial in 2025 and we will watch with great interest. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me. You're welcome, Derek. Thank you very much. And I want to thank all of you also for joining us in this episode of the Technology of Beauty, where I have the opportunity to interview the movers and shakers of the beauty business. And as you heard today, it was no exception. And let's watch Derek and his new company and see just what he can pull off over the next year and a half. Good luck, man. Thank you, sir.